Good morning, First Baptist. I'm Jed. And I'm Cale. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Freedom in Christ begins tomorrow night from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. in room 218. If you'd like to learn more, contact Roy Reed or call the church office. Women's Tuesday Night Bible Study starts this Tuesday. They will study the opening chapters of Genesis and the fundamental truths they teach us about God. This will be a 10 session, verse by verse study that dives into Genesis 1 through 11. Workbooks will be available for the first night for $17. Childcare is also available with registration. Ladies, make sure to register at fbcbolivar.org slash events. All right, students, Merge 2024 registration opened on Wednesday and filled up immediately. So praise God for that. Merge is a collaborative spring retreat on March 15th to 17th between the student ministries of FBC and K-Life. We will be going back to Sky Ranch Camp in Cave Springs, Oklahoma for an amazing weekend of worship, discipleship, growth, and fun. The goal for this weekend is to unplug from the distractions of our everyday lives and plug into God's uniting spirit. Please begin to pray for our students and leaders for this impactful weekend. Sweet. The Super Bowl is back. Our second graders host this canned food drive each year to help donate cans of soup to the local food pantry. This year's goal is 2024 cans of soup. Please bring cans to the church lobby, third floor children's area, or the office by February 11th. If you'd like to make a monetary donation, make sure to mark it Super Bowl. Awesome. Men's prayer breakfast is this Saturday. Guys, you do not want to miss this morning, including a warm breakfast and time spent in God's Word, led by Adam Hughes and Ray Leininger, focusing on the topic of the importance over urgency. And our quarterly family business meeting will be next Sunday, February 4th at 5 p.m. right here in the Worship Center. This is open to everyone and we will discuss the finances of our church. All right, fun, fun. On our way out, we have a surprise for you all. After 2023, we have decided it would be fun to make something that would encapsulate the blessing that this last year was. So we made a 2023 year in review booklet. You can grab one on your way out and reminisce on the last year. That sounds great. And if this is your first time in worship with us, we invite you to text the word GUEST to 417-282-8322. You can also visit our info hubs after the service where we can meet you and help you connect with First Baptist. Have a great day in worship. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you're here today. We want to welcome those who are listening on the radio or watching online as well. Let's begin with a reading from God's Word from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Let's stand together as we sing hymn 499, Victory in Jesus. <laughs>
continue our worship by singing Jesus Messiah. Pray with me, please. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for this time of giving. And we thank you that we can be reminded of how you have given. You've given creation. You've created, you've given our race life. You've given each one of us life. You've given each one of us a mind and a will with which to make choices. You've created us in your image that we might be able to choose you. But Father, we thank you now for a time of giving. May we give. May we give. Not because we have to, but because we want to. And because we were made to give as you have given to us. Thank you now for the opportunity. May we use it well. In Jesus' name, amen.
Continue our worship by singing together, The Lord Almighty Reigns. Yeah. 
continue our worship by reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Let's stand together as we sing, In Christ Alone.
Well, good morning, church family. It's good to see all of you, and uh, as most of you probably know, spent the better part of the last two weeks on a trip for the church and uh, country in South Asia, so it is good to be home, good to be back with you this morning. As you have seen from the intro video, we are starting a new series in the first two chapters of the Gospel of Mark. And so if you take just a moment and find your place in Mark chapter 1, and we are going to look together today at verses 1 through 13. More about that in just a moment. I would like to say ever so briefly just a few words about the trip related to but not exactly connected to that. Let me begin by saying that we had our Lottie Moon Christmas offering that does go to international missions Our goal was $48,000, and you were faithful, and I'm not surprised by that at all, and exceeded our goal. We have now reached $49,000 plus a little bit of change, so let's praise the Lord uh, for His faithfulness in using us to continue to be a church that's passionate about the work of the gospel around the world. Along those lines, let me just say this to you today, Uh, I'm going to encourage you not, not so much to pray for me. I'll, I'll be fine. I would encourage you this morning as I preach to pray for yourself. <laughs> I'll tell you why in a moment. I actually have no idea of the words that are about to come out of my mouth next. <laughs> so it could be super, super edifying or completely nonsense. I, I just don't know, but we'll trust the Spirit for that. In all seriousness, um, we left traveling back home around Thursday at noon your time, or Bolivar time, after straight travel, including time in the airport, we made it to our house 9 o'clock Friday night, Bolivar time. So 30 plus hours of travel. I normally don't get my days and nights reversed. I'm actually pretty good about that. Maybe it's just I'm getting a little older. I don't know. Um, did pretty good sleeping Friday night, and then I accidentally, not on purpose, napped all day long yesterday. Uh, so uh, went to bed and woke up about midnight and have kind of been awake ever since then. I have no idea when I'm going to fall asleep again. It could be now. I, I don't know. So <laughs> you guys pray for me. Let me say just a few words. We want to give a longer update when the appropriate time comes to the church, but let me just say a few words about the trip because I want you to hear this. I've had the opportunity to go on this trip on on several occasions, and without question, this is the best trip uh, I've ever had a chance to be a a part of, specifically to this part of the world. And I think there's a few reasons why. Number one, it's just the team that you commissioned and sent. There were four of us that went, so take me out of it for a moment, but the other three The gentlemen that went with me were phenomenal and God used in some amazing ways. First of all, Jim Roller, you guys may know Jim. Uh, What a a blessing he is to our congregation. Just an incredible lay leader in our church. God really used his calmness and his wisdom to help lead this trip. I'm so thankful for him. And then we had two college students go with us, Mason and Timmy. And I don't think I've ever personally witnessed in a foreign context two young men more engaged with people and engaged to share the gospel continuously over and over and over again than those young men, and God just really used them, so I'm praising the Lord for that. Um, Second thing I would say is uh, for uh, safety purposes, I can't mention names or locations, but we have a couple partners on the ground uh, that are working in a predominantly Muslim people group. And I would tell you that God is beginning to bear fruit amongst these people group, and we're beginning to see the gospel take root, and for that we rejoice. I can't tell you their names, but I would just ask, would you be committed and faithful to pray for our two partners? And let's just call the people group the M people group. God will know who that is. You just be faithful to pray for that people group as well. The final thing I would say to you is just thank you. I understand when I'm gone, and certainly when I'm gone for that length of time, it takes away from the work that I need to be doing here, which is important. I understand that, and maybe there's a little bit of a gap, and, uh, and I have to kind of come back and, and catch up with you all, but you are so gracious to not just let me go, 
but encourage me to go. And I would tell you, I think that's important as pastor of a church that's committed to missions and has a DNA of missions for me to be a part of leading the charge. So thank you for giving me the freedom and encouraging me to go and to be understanding. I, I would say to you, in whatever way we might define blessing, I just believe that God is going to continue to put his hand of blessing on First Baptist Bolivar because of the DNA in our past and our current practice of being passionate about the gospel and com compassionate towards people. So thank you for being who you are. With that in mind, and we will give you more information later, I want to turn our attention to the, uh, the matter at hand this morning, and that's the introduction to Mark's gospel. So would you look with me as I read the first three verses as we begin? This is what the Word of God says. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Introductions. Perhaps we all have a sense of what introductions are and what they do. Maybe you're someone in the room that thinks a good introduction is very important. Perhaps you're someone in the room that says, I could really care less about introductions. They don't really matter at all. One of my jobs, my first four years at New Orleans Seminary when I served on faculty there was to do introductions. Now, what do I mean by that? I served as dean of chapel, so I oversaw the chapel ministry. And when I presided over chapel, it was my job to introduce our guest speakers. I had a habit and was known amongst the students and my fellow faculty as giving what you might refer to as involved introductions when people would come. That's a kind way of saying long. And I'm sure you know me, you're surprised that I would do anything that would take a long time. Uh, students would get agitated about it, but my fellow faculty would really give me a hard time about it. And they would say, well, why do you do that? Well, the short answer for why we did that is because we had a problem in chapel at New Orleans. We had a little bit of celebrity worship in chapel, meaning people would really only show up when they uh, would consider the big names in chapel. And when just any other Joe Blow pastor that might have been faithful pastoring 30 years, no one would come. And I thought that was a problem. And so I would say to him, well, if you don't like that, uh, start coming to chapel and get other people to come to chapel and I'll stop it. Because I felt like it was my responsibility to make sure I gave everybody an adequate introduction to say this is who this person is. And this is why we're blessed to have them and hear them. Introductions do that, don't they? They tell us why someone has come and why they're important, why they're there. This that I just read to you is Mark's introduction in his gospel to the Son. And in this introduction, he gives an explanation of why it is the Son is important and why he's come. That's a question we all need to ask ourselves in our life, isn't it? Why do I think Jesus has come, and why does it matter? And the, the world, even believers, will give a lot of different answers to that, and maybe, maybe all of them hold some merit. Well, he's come so that I don't have to walk through life alone. It's true. He's come to, to solve my problems in life. He, he's come so that I'm not lonely. He, he's come to bless me. He, he's come to be my friend. He's come to give me an example of how I should live. There, there might be merit to all of those things, but, but I would submit to you that is not the main reason that Jesus has come. And in Mark's introduction, that's not the main reason Mark shows that he's come. So what I'd like us to do is through the lens, through the focus of asking the question, why is it important in my life that Jesus has come? I want us to look at three truths this morning in Mark's introduction. And we see the first of these truths in verses 1 through 8. It's what I'm calling John's ministry pointing to Jesus, or what we might simply refer to as preparation. John's ministry pointing to Jesus, preparation. Hear verses 1 through 3 again, and then I'm also going to read verses 4 through 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey, which, by the way, makes you really glad that you've come to the 11 o'clock service right before lunch because you're so hungry now. (laughs) And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mark begins his gospel by showing a close connection between Malachi, whose name means my messenger, and John, God is gracious. Malachi, the last written minor prophet we have of the Old Testament, and John the Baptist, the first voice in the New Testament that breaks the 400 years of silence. 400 years of no new revelation from God, as if the heaven had turned to stone and been shut up, and God breaks the silence through his messenger, John. And the way he does this is verse 2 shows us that uh, there's a quote from Isaiah, Isaiah 43. But before we get to Isaiah 43, he actually quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Malachi 3, 1, and, and Isaiah 43 shows us that In John's ministry, there is a close link in God sending someone to prepare for the coming of Christ between uh, God's message and God's grace. Maybe a better way to say it is there's a close connection between God's messenger and the one who would come to bring about his grace. John's ministry is indeed the fulfillment of prophecy. It's showing us, Mark is showing us that it's not just Jesus himself, although he does, that fulfills prophecy, but the preparation for for Jesus, the one who would be the preparer for the coming one, is also one who fulfills prophecy. Now, we might ask ourselves a question, in what way does, does John's ministry or does Mark show through the ministry of John that that Mark is fulfilling, that John is fulfilling prophecy, and that he's preparing the way for Jesus. Well, there's two things that, that Mark points out in, in John's ministry for us in these first eight verses that show us the, the work of preparation that John the Baptist was doing. There's an action that John performed, and there's an announcement that John made. And both of these things point beyond himself. Uh, Both of these point forward to something or someone else, something greater. And where do we see these? We see these in verses 4 through 8. So first of all, just, just note the action that he performed, the thing that John did that points beyond himself. Verses 4 and 5. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, when we read this, perhaps our our Baptist sensitivities trouble us a little bit because it seems like the way this is written and what John's ministry is about and the action that he's doing here is there's a very close link between the act of baptism and God's forgiveness. A close link between going into the water and the the very process of of repenting. Well, a couple things I would say to you there. Please note that that what John is doing here is is baptism that precedes what we might even think of as Christian baptism. In some ways, this is a rite of baptism. Certainly not saying there's not a connection to it, but this is not Post Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the tenets of the gospel. Uh, this, is, this is John in some way still being very linked to the prophets of the Old Testament, calling for an outward act that does, does in some way represent, closely align with the repentance that's needed in their life. And in some ways, perhaps in the Jewish mind, there is a very close connection between what you do outwardly 
and what's going on inwardly. Yet at the same time, we all would say today that we understand, not just from this passage, but the testimony of all of the New Testament, that, that as evangelicals, we don't believe it's the act of baptism that saves you. No, as a matter of fact, you've probably heard me say from the water before, we are baptizing not because we believe someone needs to be saved, but we're baptizing today because we believe someone has been saved. There's no magic in the water. It's normal water. It cannot wash away the, the stain of sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that. Yet we read here that, that John, before what we would know as Christian baptism, was baptizing in the Jordan River. We might find ourselves asking the question, why did he do this and what was the significance of this? Well, that question is answered for us at the end of verse 8, isn't it? He, he did this. In his own words, he said, was because the one coming after him, the coming one, would baptize not with water, not in the Jordan River, but with the very presence of God, with the Holy Spirit. You see, what John is saying here is, is his work isn't even simply a foreshadowing of what we know as Christian baptism. What he was doing was actually a foreshadowing. I don't want to use the word type because Scripture doesn't, but maybe type of what Jesus would actually do in salvation. See, John baptizes as a sign of the repentance of sin, the cleansing and being forgiven. But John here is referring not even to what would happen when Jesus would begin his public ministry, but John is referring to what would happen after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus when he turned to the very presence of the Father, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, and the very presence of God through his Holy Spirit comes in the lives of the believer. And John is saying, my ministry, the, the limited, minimal work that I do, is just simply a foreshadowing of that which is to come to the work and the grace of Christ. It is nothing more than preparation for what he would do. So John's act, if you will, is the fulfillment of Scripture that points forward to something that's yet to come that's even greater. But, but John didn't just prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ by his action. But verses 7 and 8, we also see that he prepared our hearts for the coming of Christ by his announcement. Not just what he did, but what he said, what he proclaimed, what he preached. Uh, just for fun, let's catch verse 6 again, but I really want to focus on verse 7. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Now, you might ask the question, why? Why in the world would Mark put those details in? Uh, Mark has a tendency to do that, as we'll see just a little bit later. Well, one of the reasons why is it, it could be, although scholars are somewhat divided on this, was because this was indicative that John actually had separated and had joined what was known as the Essene, the Essene group, the Qumran community, and this was a group that had separated themselves for purity from society that was awaiting the Messiah. But regardless, what it indicates was John was a different dude. <laughs> but more importantly than that is what he preached, what he said. We see this in verse 7. And he preached saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I. Whatever you think about me, however you consider me, perhaps even your desire to follow me, understand that there is one who is coming. There is one who is coming that's about to be here. There's something about to happen that's greater than anything that I am or any ministry that I would do. The way, the way John symbolizes this, the way he explains this is, you'll see next, he, he puts himself in the role of a servant. Not just any servant, the lowest of low servants. One that would, would deal with somebody's feet. Look what he says. He says, Mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy, worthy to stoop down and untie. We know in that day and time, there's no part of a person that would get dirtier than someone's feet because that was what was constantly connected to the world. And so I think we, we have an under, understanding, but maybe it's a limited understanding, of, of what it was like to live in a world like that to where your primary means of travel was walking and how dirty someone's feet would get. So the perhaps 
greatest act of kindness and hospitality would be to wash someone's feet or take someone's sandal off in preparation of washing their feet. And maybe the lowest, most menial servant would show yourself underneath them. And John is saying, I'm so far under this one that's coming is it's not that I don't want to do that. It's that I'm not worthy to do that. That's how great the one that you're waiting on is. I'm not even worthy to take his sandals off. That's the one you should be waiting on. And as we've already said, verse 8 indicates that even the ministry he does is just a foreshadowing. It's just a picture of what Jesus would ultimately do through the presence of the Lord. What, what Mark is showing us is even in the ministry of John, John's ministry is not a fulfillment in and of itself, although it does fulfill prophecy. It's fulfillment of prophecy, but fulfillment of prophecy only in the sense that it points us forward. John's ministry is not, a, not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's a preparation for the coming of Christ. So Mark, in his introduction, begins by showing us the significance of who Jesus is and why he came by showing us the preparation of someone's else, someone else's ministry for the coming of Christ. But number two, we don't just see John's ministry pointing to Jesus, but look in verses 9 through 11. We also see the Father's message regarding Jesus, what we might call identification Look at verses 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. One of the things that the gospel writers do early on in, uh, in their writing, early on in their introduction of Jesus is, is to show whatever concepts were, were true and anticipated of the Messiah from the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled, fulfills those. And one thing that Mark subtly does, there's this underlying, it's, it's maybe not explicit, but it's implicit in, in most of the Old Testament that the, the coming one is coming. There's a coming one that you're waiting on. As a matter of fact, in some ways, we see it as early, hinted at in, in Genesis chapter 3. Well, what Mark does, not so subtly, by the language that he uses, although it's Greek, is to show if you've been waiting on the coming one, stop waiting. He's here. And how does he do that? Well, look at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Look at verse 10. And when he came up out of the water. We'll see this again later in verse 14. Jesus is the long-awaited coming one. Now, for just a moment, I want you to imagine with me, if you've ever been in a situation where you really needed a clear sign. By the way, I'm, I'm not meaning by that something metaphorical. You know, you're, you're asking, you're wondering, should you ask this girl out and you know, she says something and you see that as a sign and then, you know, she turns you down and you realize it wasn't a sign. I'm not talking about that. Uh, you guys are being sanctimonious with me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. No, I'm talking about like a road sign, something that's actually written down that's clear so you know this is the way that I, I need to go. Well, look, in our trip over the last two weeks, we had several days to where we absolutely felt like we needed not a metaphorical sign, but we needed directions of where we should be and how do we get there. And uh, the Lord provided. The, the particular instance that I'm thinking about uh, the, the most is, is Sunday. Last Sunday was a travel day for us. We had been in one city for a few days. Sunday we were traveling, and then we would be in the other city for about four to five days, and then we would come home. And and, and in order to do this, we had to take a couple of domestic in-country flights. And uh, the flight time was only about three and a half hours, but it was literally a 13-hour travel day because we had uh, layovers in the airport, but we also had delays. Now, we were going to a city in which we didn't really know anybody in this other city, and so we weren't 100% sure how we were going to get around. Like, by that, I don't mean where we're going, but like riding in a car. Well, good news is the day before we transitioned, the hotel reached out to me, and they said, hey, do you need us to travel schedule, for, uh, tra tra schedule travel for you from the airport? And I said, yes, let's do that. And so I was excited about that, and, and I, was, I was feeling pretty good about it until actually we kept getting delayed. So they're thinking we're going to get there at 6.30, and now it becomes very, very clear we're not going to get there until 8.30. It's the most nervous I was the whole trip. The other three guys were like, it's not that big of a deal. And I'm like, it's 
not that big of a deal to you, but if I, if I mess this up, y'all are going to blame me. It's a big deal to me. <laughs> so uh, in and out of airports, we weren't getting very good reception, and I was doing my best to reach out to them as we knew updates to let them know when, I was gonna, when, when we were going to get there. Now, the problem is multiple fold here. Uh, number one, I had never, ever laid eyes ever before on the person that was supposed to be picking us up. They had never laid eyes on me, right? Um, we're not getting good cell phone service. We're getting delayed. And I'll just let y'all know, I don't speak the language in that country. Worse than that, nobody speaks Arkansan. <laughs> so we're just talking back and forth, and, and we land, and we get our baggage, and I'm trying to call him as we're walking out the airport. And as I'm trying to call him, I see it. God that I've never seen before standing outside the airport like I'm a big shot holding a sign with my name on it spelled right. That's where we're going. <laughs> Good news is we safely made it to the airport, right? Sometimes we just need a clear sign. In this passage of Scripture, verses 9 through 11, it's the Father that has the sign concerning the Son. But it's not something He's written. It's something He says. The Father speaks a word. Two, and about this coming one, the long-awaited one that's now here. For, for just a moment, let's look at the details of verses 9 through 11 here, what we see at Jesus' baptism. There's a tendency when in the Gospels we see Jesus' baptism, what we really get hung up on is, so why was Jesus baptized? Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Isn't it interesting that Mark doesn't really deal with that at all? Verse 9, he just assumes it as fact, but he doesn't really tell us why. To get a better understanding of why, you would have to go to some of the other Gospels, specifically Matthew chapter 3, Jesus' words himself. John tries to prevent him. Jesus says, don't hinder me from doing this. We need to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. Now, we don't exactly know what that means, but here's what we know it doesn't mean. It certainly doesn't mean that Jesus had any sin that he needed to be forgiven of. He was sinless. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So whatever he meant by that, he seems to be indicating the reason, the reason he was baptized is because it was the Father's will that he do so. And out of perfect, obedient righteousness to the Father, he was willing to submit himself to do that. Some people have said it was Jesus' way of, of identifying with us because all of us are going to be called as a, as a sign, if I can say it that way, of our faith to be baptized. Jesus first sets the example. Mark doesn't really deal with that. What Mark deals with more is what happened right after Jesus' baptism. Just look at verses 10 and 11 again. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. It's, it's interesting, a couple details here. Mark tells us that the heavens were torn in two. The heavens was rend open. Now, remember, the gospel writers are very careful to show that at the coming of Jesus, the advent of Christ, uh, we see the fulfillment of prophecy. Maybe this is one we don't really catch, but I'm not so certain that this is not a reference to Isaiah 64.1, where the heavens are torn open. God tears the heavens open, and look what happens. It tells us that, that as, as a response to that, that, that a voice out of heaven came and said, You are my son, and you I am well pleased. It's interesting, isn't it, that it's identified as a voice out of heaven. Now, we might find ourselves guessing in our context, why does it say this? Why doesn't it just say God said this or the Father said this? Is it speaking to someone else? Maybe it's the archangel Gabriel that said this. No, listen, there's no ambiguity at all. The idea is that God himself said this. But in Jewish context, because of their reverence and fear of God, sometimes they wouldn't use his title or his name. They would use a substitute, like heaven spoke. But the idea is always heaven spoke because it's, it's God speaking. The Father himself says this. Now, just for a moment, can we acknowledge how significant it is that in Mark's gospel, he shows us that, that John, there's a forerunner that has something to say about Jesus. But the Father doesn't leave it with that. The Father doesn't leave it with just a man to say something about the Son. The Father himself breaks the 400 years of silence to say something about the Son. This one is so important. He's so anticipated. The most important person, the most important man to ever walk the face of the earth, so significant for you that the Father himself says, I have something to say. 
And what does the Father say? You are my son. And you, I'm well pleased. Isn't it interesting that it appears that the address, the addressee of this statement is not the others that were there according to Mark. No doubt they heard. But what Mark tells us is it's the Son Himself. It's Christ Himself that's addressed. God is giving affirmation Himself to the Son. The Father is giving affirmation to the Son. You. Yet at the same time, we understand that those around would have heard and should have understood the significance of God identifying who this one is. Now, just for a moment, understand that Mark has a real passion, if I can say it this way, for identifying Jesus as the Son of God. He bookends his gospel with it. Chapter 1, then near the end of chapter 15, Jesus on the cross. Both places, Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. Now, what's interesting is in both places, it is not one of his followers. It's not one of his disciples that makes this claim, although we might think that. No, in chapter 1, it's the Father himself that we see here. In chapter 15, it is a Gentile Roman centurion that says, based on the way he died, surely that is the Son of God. What we see in Mark's gospel on the front end, his introduction and his conclusion, is we see that God is moving to show the identification of who the Son is. It is significant that he is the Son. In some ways, perhaps, maybe it's a comparison and contrast to Israel. In the Old Testament, they were supposed to be the faithful son. They failed. But this, the Son of God, will be successful to be faithful where they could not be. You see, God shows that even his work, even his ministry, his message at the coming of Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. But it's more than just general preparation. Specifically what the Father does is he, ad- he gives identification. He identifies who Christ is. So in the introduction of Mark, we see the ministry of John, we see the message of the Father. But look, finally, in verses 12 through 13. Finally, we see what we might call the movement of the Spirit leading Jesus. We see John's ministry. We see the Father's message. We we see the Spirit's movement leading Jesus, or what we might call validation. Look, verse 12 and 13. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Another really strange Uh, detail that Mark includes. Uh, We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But uh, uh, Mark, amongst all of the other Gospels, is uh, kind of identified as the shortest of all four. Word count-wise, chapter-wise, only 16 chapters. But of the synoptics, clearly it leaves out some details that that Matthew and Luke add in. As such, it's kind of considered the fast-moving Gospel. And Mark seems to be doing this intentionally because regularly he uses this word immediately, immediately, immediately. We've already seen him do that a couple times, and he does it again here in verse 12. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Isn't it interesting when we look at the details that the Spirit's the one that drives him out into the wilderness, and we know it's to be tempted, but we know 40 days, after he's there 40 days, Satan shows up and he gives him three specific temptations. We might find ourselves asking the question, are are the Spirit and the devil in cahoots together? Are they kind of working together against Jesus? Well, we know that's not the answer. It seems to be a little bit like what we see in the story of Job. God allowing some things, God setting up some things and allowing Satan access, but for a bigger purpose. Satan might have one intent, but God has a bigger intent. And I think that's the case here with Christ. And we ask ourselves the question, what is that intent? Well, just ever so quickly, let's, let's try to discover what were or what is the reason the Spirit drove the Son into the wilderness. I'm a Baptist preacher, so I have three V's for you as we think about that. Um, I thought that would get a bigger laugh. Sorry about that. Got three V's for you. The first one's absolutely unequivocally wrong. The second one might be kind of right, but I think it's the third one that's the point. First of all, uh, the Spirit did this to be vindictive. There was a rift. There was jealousy amongst the three persons of the Godhead. 
of the Trinity. The, the Spirit was jealous of the Son. God has just said of the Son, I'm well pleased, and the Spirit says, well, He didn't say that to me, so I'm going to send Him to the wilderness to be vindictive. Well, we know that's not what happened. Not at all. There's no rift. There's no problem with the relationship amongst the persons, the three persons of the Trinity. Well, secondly, we might say maybe it was to win a victory. I think there's some truth to this, right? Winning a victory over Satan. There's a sense in which from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, before he ever goes to the cross, there's a death nail driven and spoken against Satan himself, even if he doesn't completely recognize it. And we see that here. So I think that's partially true. But I think the biggest reason, and I think what Mark is emphasizing here, is it's actually for what we might call validation validation of who Jesus is, validation that he can be trusted, validation that he can, be, that he can save us, validation that we should follow him. And, and how is that the case? Well, just for a moment, look at this. He, he was driven out into the wilderness, and we know, according to the other Gospels, he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, and then at the end of that, Satan came to him and issued three specific temptations towards him. The most important thing is that Jesus, Jesus didn't sin. He, he didn't fail at any of those things. Now, just for a moment, let's think about the temptations that Satan issued against him. Just pick one of them. What's crazy about most of them is, is actually there's truth to all of them. All of them, to some extent, are true or true of Christ. Think, think for a moment the one we think about where, where Satan says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms, kingdoms of the earth. Can I let you in on a little secret? All of the kingdoms on the earth already belong to Jesus. All of them are ultimately going to bow down, confess Him, and worship Him. So how is that a temptation? Well, let me tell you what I think. You won't find this explicitly in Scripture. But God's intent is for Jesus to receive the worship and the recognition from all the nations of the cross by going through the cross, not by avoiding it. And the temptation was Satan was trying to get him to bypass the cross. You know what Jesus said? Nope. But all those things all are already his. But really what we see here is that the validation is that Jesus is sinless. Jesus never sinned. There was not one second when Jesus was disobedient to the Father. And the movement of the Spirit leading Jesus is, is showing that. Jesus didn't grow into his sinlessness. He didn't have a few things to work out first. No, he was always sinless. And through the validation of the Spirit, we see that. Well, why is that so important for us? Well, we sing about it. You've heard me quote it before. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just was satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. But I, I like to say it this way. You understand, if you have your own sins to die for, you can't die for the sins of somebody else. Jesus is the only one that didn't have his own sins to die for. And that's validated by the work of the Spirit, even in the introduction of Mark. Which leads us, perhaps, to the strangest part of this passage. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Like, what is Mark up to here? Is he just letting us know that Jesus really loved animals? Good news, everyone. If you're an animal lover, Jesus has his PETA membership card. All good. <laughs> Y'all are more asleep than I am today. <laughs> and that's saying something. We're almost done. Help me out. We're going to make it through it together. Right? No, that's not what's going on. What? What is God's Word here? What is Mark getting at? He's saying there weren't, there's nobody else around. There weren't any other people. So there weren't other people there to help him. Jesus, from a man-to-man -man standpoint, was completely alone. So we find ourselves asking the question, so does that mean the Father didn't love him? The Father didn't care about him? No, not at all. There was never a moment where the Father didn't care about the Son. There was never a moment where the Father didn't love the Son. Matter of fact, he was completely alone. So God sent his holy angels to care for him and minister to him. That's how much God loved him. That's how much God cared about him. That's how God was ministered to him, even when he was completely and utterly alone. The care of the Father for the Son. We find ourselves asking the question when we look at this is, is some, the argument is, could Jesus have actually sinned or could he not have sinned? Listen, we can have that argument, but that's not the point. The point is, he never did. This validates the identity, and it, it, it validates the ministry of Jesus. Just for a moment, do you find how interesting it is that in Mark's introduction, he shows us that all three members of the Trinity are involved in the introduction of Jesus? The Spirit descends upon him. 
The Father speaks a word about him, and the Son himself never fails. You know, I actually could show you, I, I was in a different country when I was writing the sermon, and I thought better of including verses 14 and 15. You are so glad right now that I did, but you'll see this next week. We can see preparation, identification, and validation, but next week as Jesus actually begins his ministry, we actually see inauguration. We see the involvement of the Son once more. So we go back to the original question. Why is Jesus important? Why did he come? And why does that matter for us? Well, in Mark's introduction, here's how Mark introduces the Son. Mark shows us that Jesus is the promised Son who is pleasing to the Father and perfect without sin. And that matters immensely to us. It literally changes our eternity. So perhaps when we think about that, and we think about why it matters to us, what the theology behind this for is, maybe we think about uh, uh, how that famous theologian in 2006, John Mayer, <clears throat> communicated this truth and now the well-known song, Waiting for the World to Change. And I'm afraid that maybe I have greatly misestimated my audience when I tell you that song, but just listen to the lyrics for a moment. He said, now we all see the ongoing, we all see the problem, we all see the going on problem of the world and those who lead it. We just feel like we don't have the means to rise above and defeat it. That's why we're waiting, waiting on the world to change. I keep on waiting, waiting on the world to change. Yeah, we're waiting, waiting on the world to change. That, that sounds pretty good. Maybe, maybe that's how the first century Jews thought. Yeah, we're, it's a mess. We're waiting on the world to change. Uh, maybe that's how we feel sitting here today. We're, we're still waiting on the world to change. May, maybe that would be obviously the, uh, the, the theology of the world today. Maybe that is a good song that captures the theology. I would tell you that's probably not the, the best song that captures the theology we should have at all after looking at this passage of Scripture. See, we're not waiting on the world to change. God has already done through the coming of the Son everything necessary to change the world and our lives and eternity in the world. We're not waiting on the world to change. God is waiting on us to see, recognize, and exalt the Son. In conclusion today, I would tell you a much better song is that great hymn of the faith, Faith, Come Ye Sinners. Come now weary and heavy laden, those who are lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're perfect, you will never come at all. Not the righteous. Not the righteous. Sinners. Sinners. Jesus came to call. That is the nature. That is the identity. That is the ministry of the Son. Amen. And amen. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Father, we do thank you so much for your love and your grace to us that's displayed in the very identity, the very nature, the very presence, and the very actions of the Son. It is our prayer this morning, if there's someone in the room that that has never repented of their sins and, and trusted Christ and His finished work on the cross, I pray through, through what is seen in this passage, perhaps even through my garbled explanation of it, that, that Your grace, Father, would be seen and heard and known this morning. And we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. But Father, for those of us that profess and know You as Lord and Savior, it's, it's my prayer that this would waken in us a fresh confidence of the salvation that we have. And out of that confidence would grow an excitement, a renewal of worship for this one that you've sent, the one, Father, who is primary, the one who has saved us. And then, Lord, I pray that we would leave this place with this new confidence and this worship, and we would go out in the world representing him and proclaiming his gospel. Lord, we need you, we thank you, and we thank you for your word this morning as we thank you for your word afresh every day in our life. Lord, you have your way, and we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and respond this morning as we sing?
Hymn 294, Jesus is Lord of all. Thank you for being here this morning. If you would like to have another conversation or follow up, uh, you can come and talk with one of us after the service. We're easy to find. Or you can text the word CONNECT to that number right on the screen. If you are a first-time guest, you can also meet Pastor Adam. He'll be back in the hospitality room. He would love to catch up with you. If you have a few more announcements, if you would like to sign up for a small group, you can do that in the lobby right after the service. Also in the lobby are those end of year booklets mentioned in the announcements. I'm happy to announce our newest staff member, Michael Green is here. Mike, lift your hand way up. There we go, if you, yep. If you would like to meet him, he'll be right around in that area. We hope you'll do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the great strong reminder this morning that you came to us you sent us your son who is worthy and even though we were not worthy lord you loved us and sent your son so that we could have a relationship with you thank you for that great reminder this morning in jesus name amen have a great sunday